こんにちは。はじめまして。Then, then it stops. <laughs> Sorry.、Uh, my name is Bas.、Uh, my name is Hakim. This is Sami. Sami does not have a microphone, but he has a webcam. What is writing? Like Gary said, lots of our work is,、uh, from our type design is based on writing. So, writing is an issue which、uh, kept us busy for the past 20 years and is very much in our work. But we still figure out what it really is. And if you want to figure it out, probably people in Ethiopia know this book by、uh, Kira Nozai, which is about writing,、uh, the theory of writing. Theory of writing. Um, and basically, he tries to figure out what writing means for him in this book. And it's also interesting that in the book, he also says that there is not really a history of writing, which means we do not really know like, where the letter really came from. Why do we make letters? There's another book, Laws of Form. By George Spencer Brown, which is probably less known in this room、uh, because it's not about visual type design at all,、um, but more about mathematics. But there's a strong similarity between these two books. And in this book, he introduces a new sign.、Uh, it could be this, which is called the mark of distinction. And what's、uh, interesting with the mark of distinction is that he uses it as an operand, as an operator at the same time. So, with just a single sign, he can explain everything. And、uh, the most uh, famous uh, sentence of the book is、uh, at the very beginning, where he says, like, a distinction is perfect、uh, continence. And if you compare that to the book of h e r i t n o t z a i then with this sentence, basically both say the same in a very general term. So, they're talking about the same thing, but in a, from a different perspective. So,、uh, one person、uh, talks about the stroke, that this circle for him is a stroke. So, when Gerrit Notzer sees a circle, he says, like, the circle is a stroke. And when、uh, George Spencer Brown sees the circle, he says that,、uh, like, just go to the next one, the circle is a form. So, it's just a different perspective how they look at those things, at those signs. But basically,、uh, they both mean the same. Like, when you, as a type designer, we're just drawing、uh, black and white shapes. And basically, they both say when you have a shape, you always have like, something which is marked or something which is unmarked. So, that would be the perspective of、uh, George Spencer Brown. And the perspective or the terminology of、uh, Gerrit Notzai would be light and dark. But basically, they are、uh, totally identical. And you could also find other. Explanation for the same thing. You could also say that it's a letter is nothing else than creating something out of nothing in a very general, from a very general perspective. So if you try to define like what writing is really about and you try to find a very like general explanation, then perhaps writing is nothing else than、uh, drawing distinctions. And whatever you call it, like it can be light or dark, or it can be、uh, marked or unmarked, it, you can call it anything you want. It can be inside, outside, something, nothing, or yin or yang. And like we said, probably most people know、uh, this book and know the person behind this book.、Uh, they have an idea of, this,、uh, of who he is. And with this book,、uh, Even if people know the book, probably you don't have an idea who's the person behind this book. So that's a photo of him. And the book was、uh, published precisely 50 years ago. And so you can show, the, show you the picture of George Spencer Brown, that you can get an idea of the person who wrote the book, 
but perhaps what gives you a much better impression of the person is to just show his handwriting. That's also a portrait of the person, and when we look at that, we create imme immediately a kind of, we create an idea of the person who wrote this book, just looking at the handwriting. And all the handwritings are always very, very different because it's not only one muscle, but in total it's 33 muscles which work together when we are writing. And so it's very complex. If you want to know which muscles, then these are the muscles. Some of them. Some of them, not, all, not, all, not even 33 here. Basically, this is what we use while defining our writing. So we're still try trying to figure it out with this writing, what it really means, and not only what it means, but also where it started. It started a long, long time ago, but that's a, probably a whole different subject. It needs a, another time. But you could also ask your question, if it's not true that since we have hands, we use those hands also in some or another way for writing. Second question, why type? Uh, first of all, it's much easier uh, to distribute your thoughts or the, what you, whatever you have written, you can much easier distribute it. Like, uh, we all know the, well, in the West we had Gutenberg and what the revolution was, what it cost. So distribution is much easier compared to handwriting. Uh, producing writing is also much easier when you have a machine to help you. Nowadays we mostly use a keyboard. Uh, the machine can be anything. But the machine can help you to uh, have much faster uh, writing. And third, the creation, if we want to create text now on the computer, it would not have been possible at all without typified writing, or without typography. So if you look at the software of this machine, for example, the program which, like, which we see here, MacPaint, then of course we see uh, typified uh, language. So these are the first uh, 20 lines uh, of the program. And what's uh, especially interesting is like what they used this typified language for. In the first demo, they showed this Macintosh. Probably lots of people know about that, but yeah, we can show it again. I think that's very, very interesting that if you look at history and if you look at the machines, what we created, it's also a little bit like since we make machines, we always wanted to have those machines to write as beautiful as we do. Yeah. So it's funny, like first we have handwriting, finally we have typography, and then with typography we can make this, and the first thing we do is make something which can write, which is somehow strange, but this writing machine it's not something from the past decades. Uh, 250 years ago, uh, a French man was all, all already dreaming of this uh, writing machine. So these are physical puppets which allow you physically to write something, but then in a machine. So it's not something from the past decades. It's, it's a dream human beings have already for a long while. So there are different ways of writing, like basically there are two ways of writing, like one is by, either by hand and the other one is that you use a, a machine for it. And uh, with a hand you could use a, a pen or a brush or, or whatever tool and then with a machine you could at the moment use for example a, a keyboard. And these are different writing, in, uh, writing instruments for the same purpose, you want to write a text. And if you compare those two, what the exact consequences are of writing with these different instruments, you will see that one is quite different than the other. So this is a child trying to write 
a word, and then on, if you would have done the same on the, compu on the computer, that would have been something like that. But if you look closely, then you will see that all these E's, they are different. Well, they are, they are all identical. And then, of course, people could say, like, yeah, but when I use typography, I can also make uh, all the letters, like, a little bit different, smaller or bigger. But still, if you do that, it's very important to realize that all the E's are still the same type. They are, you could say, tokens of the same type. They are just scaled a little bit. So in that way, there is a very big difference between writing by hand and writing with a machine. And the difference is that what actually happens if you write with a hand is there is a word in your head, so you create the text, you take the pen, and only once you define the text, you define the letter, letter by letter by letter. And this order is just the other way around with uh, typography. There, first, there's a set of letters created, designed, and then after that, we define the text. So it's just the other way around. And in that way, you could say that uh, uh, handwriting uses like uh, uh, handmade letters and typography, that's the definition that Gerrit Notzer also introduced, is the writing with prefabricated letters. And from that, we can go one step further and say, like, okay, what does it mean? So writing handwriting is actually writing with made-to-order letters. So I create the letter only at the moment I need it. And with typography, it's actually the writing with ready-mates. Yeah, we try to keep it slow for the translator to give him some space. So I think perhaps this seems like a, a self-evident questions, but perhaps this is a, a one of the most important questions we have to ask ourselves now at this moment. Because if you look like what is a letter, we get this definition. Basically, it's a symbol which is uh, representing something. And from that is that we have here those symbols and we can count those symbols also. Like for example, here we have the sentence and the sentence is actually autological because it says what it is so we can also count and we see that there are actually 28 letters. It's like one, two, three, four and so on. So every letter I can count. I can clearly see like that's letter one, two, three. And if I make a variable font, people could say like, yeah, nothing changes because here I can still count even those letters are changing, like still I have one, two, three, four, six, seven. But this is not always the case. Like, if you look here, then the question is like, what is this here in the middle? It's a letter because we, re we recognize it as a, as a letter, but how many letters is that? Like this is a variable form, and this is just a navigation to, to, uh, to play with this uh, variable form. And technically this is just one letter, but the variable form is built so it can get any letter. So the question is, is this one letter or 26? And then we come back to the definition of a letter and then the question is if the definition of a letter still, is still valid for our current period, time period. So maybe we should have an addition in the dictionary. Next to the letter, we should also have maybe a definition of a variable letter where uh, it's still a symbol which is representing something, but it, it can be uh, a causal symbol, so it can be uh, triggered by something, which is very different than what we, have, what we know so far as a letter, which is always static. So until now, the letter what was what it is, and now it's more what it can become. And so the letter logic, where A is not equal B, is 
replaced by something which you could call like a form causality. The form is what it becomes. And in that way, this is, we know as movable type. And so for the right, we have to get new terminology and we could call this uh, a causal writing. It also means that the existing terms which we use, you could question them if they are still valid for everything. So we have this uh, word typography, like everybody offers, everybody here is busy with typography, which is, uh, comes from typos, typified, and graphia with the uh, writing. But it means like this writing with these prefabricated letters. And now we actually not writing with prefabricated letters anymore, but with letters which may react to the user or, and or also to the reader. So actually then the term typography doesn't apply anymore because it's not typos anymore. Maybe grammatos would be a much more uh, specific term for this. Because it's important to realize that letter, the term letter does not imply that this has to be static. So in that way, we can use this uh, uh, term grammatos in a new way. And if you put these two together, grammatos and graphia, then you come up with grammatography, which is maybe a term which is more, uh, applies more to this time. We're not the first ones to use this term. Like uh, 400 years ago, there was a Dutch guy Borsens, Cornelis Dirksen Borsens, who made his uh, lettering book, and he once made a lettering book, which actually, if you zoom in on the title page, you can see that the title of the book was Grammatography. So that's from 1605. And we're not sure what he was thinking of, it's always difficult when something is that old to really uh, be 100% sure what this person was really thinking about when introducing this term. But it's, it is there, so it must have, have had a meaning to him. So he, it's a writing book to show like, uh, his capabilities of a, as a, well, we could call it now a, a calligrapher but maybe he was thinking of something else. Like you see all these small parts of letters which you can construct a complete letter. So maybe he was actually already dreaming of something else, which maybe he was dreaming of to write with all these letters. So maybe he had the same dream as we have, of just writing with letters.
Thank you. That's enough. So if we look back on everything uh, which we did in the past 20 years, then maybe we were always having a shared dream without realizing it. So we try to put a couple of things in perspective. Uh, we're starting in uh, 2006 when there was a festival, a cultural festival in The Hague where we had an event and uh, for this event we made an animation. And animation looked more or less a bit like this. And it was an animation which was done in uh, Flash, so it was just like, it didn't have to do anything with typography. And we just had the idea to create this, but now we have the idea that we did not really understand back then why we wanted to create that. Because sometimes you only understand afterwards what you are actually doing and why you are doing what you are doing. So this is an animation, this is a movie, this is not, there's no semantic values in this text here at all. Uh, some years later, we went to Copenhagen to the We Love Graphic Design Festival and we were asked to make the, the identity for this festival. And one of the things we did was make a font which could be used to announce the speakers, for example. And it's a writing font. It was a first real writing font. But technically, this is before a variable introduction of variable fonts. Basically, it works a little bit like a stop motion, uh, uh, stop motion font. So with different frames and with a little JavaScript, and with the JavaScript, you could talk to the different frames within the font. So we were happy, but not completely happy with it. Then two years later, uh, went to Berlin to the Typo Labs conference where we had a presentation. In this presentation, we uh, also presented the super font. And the super font is a typeface which contains any possible typeface in the world, in any script. It's just a matter of finding the right location within the super font, and then you will have it. Any typeface which has been made and which will ever be made. So when we presented that, we made the point that with this you can make everything. And only two months later we realized like when we can do with this everything, then we can also do all those things which we always thought which were not possible. So that was very interesting later on that this created new possibilities. So we knew it's all within this super font. When we were right, what we said, we just have to find it. Yes, very often we do things and then it takes us a time before we realize what it actually meant for ourselves, what we did. And then when it's writing always has a time dimension. So that's also very important. So when we went to Montreal, uh, ATA by Montreal, we showed there our uh, ideas about bringing this dynamics into the font. Basically, there are, there are two main aspects, which is the stroke direction and the curvature. And those two uh, parameters you can actually use to create a dynamic uh, motion. So when the stroke goes up, the speed is slower than when the stroke goes down. So that's one, that's the direction. And the other is the curvature. The more the curve bends, the slower the stroke gets. So on the top, that's very slow. On the straight parts, it's it's rather fast. And you can also see that there are two strokes here, which means you first make one stroke, and then when you're finished, you lift your, normally you lift your pen from the paper, and then you go to the second stroke, which means there's a little stroke delay, so you can add now, you can time as an extra dimension to your font. So time basically becomes like a default part of a font now. One year later, we got a big uh, assignment to, which helped us to continue working on this, on these kind of projects. And we want to thank uh, those people who gave us this assignment because otherwise this stuff would not be possible what we show now also later on.
And the same year, we went again to Typo Labs and we uh, presented something else called HOI, which is uh, higher order interpolation. And basically, it helps us to interpolate not on a linear line, but on a curved line. So on the left, you will see uh, regular interpolation, everything, how we interpolated so far. And on the right, you will see how interpolation works with HOI, with higher order, HOI, higher order interpolation. So that was important for ourselves to realize, okay, that's finally what we can do. And with this uh, knowledge, we could actually build the first font, which was uh, totally based on uh, a HOI interpolation. And this was first shown in uh, Portland at the TypeCon. So that uh, uh, bellow right. And so that's really the first complete font we ever built, which was using only higher order interpolation on everything. And what's interesting is, like, especially if you zoom in, if you look like, at the details, you see that everything m moves exactly how you want to have it. So there's a kind of infinite resolution. So we also use those lectures to uh, figure out stuff for ourselves, what we're doing. And while we're doing it, we also try to reflect on what we're doing. So sometimes when we have a lecture, like at the end of the lecture, uh, visitors get a booklet, and the booklet belongs to the lecture. It's part of the lecture. So this was a booklet uh, made for a lecture in Munich at the Dynamic Fund Day. And this is a small booklet which was made for the ICTV. Ooh, IC TVC in uh, Patras in Greece a few months ago. And reflecting on your own work then helps yourself to put things in the right perspective. So, yeah. so uh, actually what we try to combine is like on one side you have the technology, but technology without the application is not very useful. So you also need an application and third there's al al already a meaning. There should be a meaning for something. So. Yeah, basically it's very simple. The first is about how, how do you achieve something? And then once you have the technology, you can uh, decide like, what do I use this technology for? But perhaps the very most important question is the last one, because why would you do that? Why would that make sense? Because I think the why only defines the relevance of something. And so now that we did all these talks, we believe that today it's the moment where we can bring it together, everything, and also focus on this, uh, the why. So, with uh, Gramato, we want to introduce uh, the best of both worlds. So the best of handwriting and the best of typography. And basically with Gramato, what, what the name already says, it's just writing with letters. So there are a few uh, important aspects for this. Uh, one, actually, that it's uh, impressive, and that's very easy to understand. Like yeah. On the left, you have a dot. On the right, you also have a dot. And you will see one is moving, and the other one is static. And probably the attention first goes to the moving part. Even if you would say, like, oh, no, look here. <laughs> or look there. <laughs> or if you give it a color. Oh. Everything which moves automatically gets more attention. So moving attracts attention, and every written word results out of movement. The second part is aesthetical. Um, when uh, Gutenberg made his 42-line uh, Bible, you can see that he already made all these different variations of these letters. Uh, to make this perfect, fully justified text. So he chopped off some parts from the letters to uh, save some space. Um, so basically, what he already tried to do there is like make a better version of handwriting. Because in handwriting, this would have been very, very hard. So in that way, you can use technology to replace craftsmanship, or you can also use it to amplify craftsmanship. So in that way, 
when you use technology and craftsmanship together, you can get something which you could call a super craftsmanship, which is like a, a even better than the craftsmanship. So in that way, when you look at uh, something like this, it's beautiful, but it, like this is uh, a Biang Biang, the most complex Chinese character, and it's like the food, which you see on the right. And it, because it's so complex, even if you are like a very talented calligrapher, it's very hard to keep control on every stroke of this complex character because it has so many strokes. So in that way, we can use now uh, Kamato to perfectionize the craftsmanship. So that's still a letter. It's not like an animation, what you saw about the War of Worlds, is what we made in Flash. This is still a letter, which is important to realize. And the cool thing is that now we have full control so when we look at the uh, formula again, what we just showed, it's not only the super craftsmanship, which is important, but perhaps even more important is that it's instant and we have full control. We can do it as often as we want, wherever we want. Uh, so in that way, now that, that we have full control, we can also apply that for like uh, any letter we write because yeah, we can just use the technology to have it written and bleeding and whatever as we want to have it. That's full control. Another thing that can be used for a third aspect is uh, education. Education has changed in the past uh, centuries. Like we're not uh, with uh, 60 people in front of one teacher, or 100 pupils in front of one teacher who's telling you what to do. Uh, things have changed. Um, with some scripts more important than with other scripts, is, uh, for example, how to write, it's important to learn a certain language. So, for example, with this uh, Biang Biang, uh, it's very hard to learn the order of, of the strokes and where to go, uh, unless you make uh, 100 uh, lines of, uh, how, what's the word? You have to write lines from your teacher. <laughs> Thousand times the word Biang Biang. So in that way, uh, stroke order and direction is perhaps an important aspect uh, of some uh, characters, like the Chinese characters, which they say is like wrong, strong order, wrong stroke order. So if you don't know the correct stroke order, it's very hard to learn actually uh, reading and writing. And uh, perhaps the last uh, aspect, uh, what we want to mention is the uh, societal and expression. If you look at the uh, history of uh, writing, which does not exist, <laughs> but, and you see how this evolved, then it's very interesting that it actually got always much more effective. So, because there's two things basically which is important. One is uh, transcribing thought and the other one is, is expression. And Marshall McLuhan said like, that the typewriter cannot translate the expression, only the thought. So. Once you compare those, the uh, transcribing of thought got actually very effective because uh, where you had like a, to write a whole sentence here, you can only just take one emoji. Like you can write much, much faster. You can communicate much faster. But at the same time, we also realized because those sentences are like uh, prefabricated, you could say it's not only the letter but the whole sentence, that the expression goes the other way. Maybe that can be changed when we have chromatography. This is what we hope for. So we're very happy uh, that uh, uh, Grammato is now finally here and it has its own website which is now live since today and you will get a Small preview here. On the top you will see uh, again the same letter which is uh, moving into any other letter. And 
it's still maybe not 100% clear for everybody what it really is, chromatography, so we show a few examples how it could possibly be used in practice today. So a, a few uh, case studies. Uh, first one would be for devices. It can be any device. This device uh, is a chromatographer. Yeah, because that's basically just using a font file and very simple script to take the time and translate it to the, to the, for the font. It can be, uh, you know, like implemented everywhere because, you know, wherever you have a free type, you can actually implement that. So you can use it for wearables or for e-bikes or espresso machines, cars. What else? In Japan, they would use it on toilets. Toilets. <laughs> And uh, perhaps, uh, let me see, uh, ticket machines. But it's like, you know, we can implement it just already today. We have all the technology and we have, that's important. Just to show it works. <laughs> My phone, for example, it's working here. So what time is it? Okay. Quarter past. Quarter past. We're still on time. And another example, uh, social media. It, uh, social media wasn't there 20 years ago. It changed society and probably social media will keep on developing. So maybe writing could be part of this changing development as well in social media. Or like we just said, education has changed in the past centuries, so maybe uh, a digital app, for example, could also be part of education, how to teach uh, uh, kids uh, how to write. completely different example, uh, operating systems. Maybe chromatography could be applied in operating systems. So whenever you have text and, you know, like for us, we don't know how the Chinese uh, works, so we just select the text and we use the contextual menu and then there's not only lookup but also write. We select it and then uh, the pop-up window will show us how this character is uh, written and uh, so we know actually how to read it and what it, what it means. 
And again, like all is based on fonts and on text, so it's not like movies. It can be just implemented uh, straight away. So there is no reason uh, uh, to wait. Yeah, there's one reason to wait. We have to wait for macOS 10.16. <laughs> or we have to wait for uh, Windows 12. But it's important that with this, those case studies, we want to show like what's possible here and now. But uh, at the same time, we also believe that there's a bigger picture. Because all those case studies, what we now showed, like uh, the social media and the apps, iOS and so on, they are, we can clearly understand those uh, examples. We can, un we can understand it, we could, Im could imagine that those things get implemented straight away. But at the same time, perhaps there's a much bigger picture which is still uh, uh, hidden, a bigger relevance for the writing with letters, for chromatography. And this bigger picture, it's very hard to imagine because I think 20 years ago, we could also not imagine something like social media or something like uh, Airbnb or whatever. The only way how you could understand that is to look from a different angle. And so, for example, in the 90s, they already said, like, technology will be used that, for example, everybody will be in contact with each other, which is actually Twitter, which is, social media is about that. They didn't name it, but they said, like, what, what is it about, about the why? And so with chromatography, I think the big question which we have to ask ourselves is, like, why do we write? What is writing really about? And we had earlier this uh, quote from uh, uh, Marshall McLuhan that the typewriter is a tool for expression or translating thoughts, but not expression. And perhaps that's something what is uh, totally overlooked or too much overlooked in the last couple of hundred years, that writing is not only uh, about putting down thought, but it's also very much about expressing, like something for, a, for human beings to express themselves. And like Akeem said, it might be hard to imagine, but we can imagine that at a certain moment we don't use a keyboard anymore at all. This we can all imagine. So if you try to think further, then there are lots of possibilities. playing Algar, I think I can put in every type of emotion, and I feel as if me and the cello were just were one. When I move my fingers, it's as if I'm putting it on like clouds or something, and I feel that when I play the music, I actually can possibly feel what the composer was trying to put into the notes. So what's important, what the girl is saying is that it's a tool for expression, and she's becoming one with a tool. So in that way, this, for her, the cello, she's becoming one with the cello, and so it's an instrument for music, as it is an instrument for expression. And we showed before uh, Lisa why, and perhaps we can look from the same perspective, as she looks at her instrument, look at Lisa Y. And that way it's also an instrument not only for writing, but also for expression. If you think it's interesting but hard to understand, <laughs> could be possible, then we could make it easier for you. We uh, have an exhibition in Tokyo, not very far from here, which opens tomorrow in uh, the print gallery, which also relates to this theme, from topography to chromatography. It's an exhibition we made in a col collaboration with Rob Botov, a Dutch artist. Um, at this URL, the printgallerytokyo.com, you will find the address. 
Um, the official opening is coming Saturday at half past five, runs till Sunday. And if you think, oh, that overlaps with Eta Pi, that's completely correct. <laughs> so therefore, tonight, uh, we have a special Eta Pi preview. So if you're interested in seeing this exhibition but you don't have the time during the conference, you can join us after the lecture. Uh, just come to us after the lecture and then uh, we are going there uh, to the exhibition. It's a small exhibition, but it's the first exhibition we did with, a, with one letter. So uh, you can see uh, like uh, one letter there. <laughs> but one which is like, I don't know. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh. Oh. We need, uh, we have a little bit more. We need to slide. One second. Can you put the projection back? One second. We, uh, as we said before. Can we put the projection back? Oh, yeah. Sometimes we make a small publication which belongs to the lecture because people sometimes still have questions after a lecture. Uh, also for this lecture, we made a small uh, publication from typography to grammatography. So it belongs to this lecture. It's made for today. Um, <laughs> some people will get But it's only here, only today. So when you leave the room, also the people with the, in the translation room, when you leave the room, you get this publication to uh, have some... <laughs> <laughs> And thank you, Eta Pi. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank Underwear for their wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, contact them afterwards if you'd like to go to the reception.